Well, welcome everybody. I'm Doug Mitchell. I have the great privilege of serving as the executive director of the Glacier National Park Conservancy. I'm joined um, tonight by the team that really makes all of this possible. Uh, Grace Kinsler, Sean O'Leary, Jill Bridgman. Um, thank you all uh, for all the work you do to make these book club uh, events possible and Glacier Conversations and all the other magic that happens uh, at the Glacier National Park Conservancy. Um, so it is just a treat to uh, have Matthew Dickerson with us again. Um, for those of you who uh, are longtime book clubbers, you will remember Matthew from last year. Um, those of you new to the Glacier Book Club here in 2022, welcome. This is our first uh, book club of the year. We have six amazing books and six amazing, equally amazing authors um, this year to share with you. Um, and Matthew, thank you uh, for once again, um, staying up late on the East Coast, uh, where it is very chilly and uh, spending some time with us. Thank you for having me. I, I, it's um, fun to meet or see so many people who care about such a wonderful place. Well, it's, um, you know, thank you uh, in, for many things. Uh, Matt, this is the third book in a series of four that Matthew um, is writing. Um, this book, uh, A Fine Spotted Trout, Trout on uh, Corral Creek. Um, and Matthew, after our last book club, um, you guys must have really treated him nicely uh, because he called and said, you know, I'd like to um, put a little snippet in the book about the Conservancy's work, um, comma, I would like to donate all of my royalties from the book to you, comma, and I would like to ask my publisher to match my contributions. Um, and it, uh, you know, Matthew, that's a big deal to us. And it just, it means so much that you would do that for us, that you would stand up with the Conservancy mm -hmm. as we do our work helping preserve this place for future generations. So thank you for that a great commitment. Mm -hmm. And thank you to all of you for buying the book uh, and in so doing, uh, contributing yet again uh, to, to the Glacier Conservancy uh, in a way that is leveraged by Math Matthew's publisher and, um, and really is, uh, it tells a great story. And, and that's what we're here tonight to do is to hear from Matthew and to be able to hear a little bit more about the story of his time uh, here in Glacier National Park as an artist in residence and to kind of pick your brain a little bit, Matthew, about what you learned about the cutthroat trout and um, your, the science that you bring to the book is also quite compelling. So, you know, maybe we'll start there, you know, and, and have you talk a little bit. I think you might have some pictures. You know, what's the big deal? What's the special nature of these West Slope cutthroat trout about which you write? Wow, that's a great question. Um, you know, I think uh, a couple answers. One is just the simple, the simple fact that they that they really are um, a, a, the the cutthroat species in general is really genetically diverse, and when they colonized uh, North America and kind of really managed to get over some watersheds in the Rockies, um, and reached these isolated rivers river systems, they began to to micro adapt to local river systems and local climates and, and um, really beautifully, wonderfully adapt to very sort of very localized uh, ecosystems. And so not only is the cutthroat trout the um, probably the second most widely distributed uh, trout in, in North America before they were largely um, wiped out in a lot of places by a European colonization, um, second only to lake trout, but also it's a very genetically diverse species. And as they micro adapted, you know, and began to um, evolve in local ecosystems, the whole ecosystems evolved around them. So, so many other species from, you know, things like grizzly bears to osprey to, to insects have, have co-evolved and co-adapted with them. So whole ecosystems all up and down the Rockies are sort of dependent on or co-dependent on, um, on the species of cutthroat trout that or the subspecies or strain of cutthroat trout that really inhabited and, and colonized that area, which in Glacier National Park is the West Slope, West Slope cutthroat. It's really, um, it's really interesting. We're, we're continuing to do a lot of work. And those who follow the Conservancy projects, um, we will again be working with the park 
Uh, they don't have funds to be able to restore the fishery. Uh, and so we are working again with them this year to repopulate the West, Thro West Slope Cutthroat uh, into their native streams. It's really an interesting process, as you probably know. It involves the harvesting of eggs and the chucking them in a cool backpack and hustling their way, often on foot, because a helicopter yeah. is not either available or appropriate to put them in um, Quartz Lake, something like that, for example. Um, so we'll be doing another project, thanks to generous contributions um, this year, to um, remove invasive species and put back in um, the other species. So how would, how do I know? So I'm a I'm, I'm interested in what you're talking about. I'm looking in a stream, or I see somebody's caught a fish. Um, to, what am, what am I looking for to tell me that this is a West Slope cutthroat? Well, you know, one way, of course, is through genetic studies. And I'm, I, my guess is probably some of the work you're funding is going to some of the genetic studies. When I was there in 2017, I spent time with um, USGS and National Park Service biologists who, to, who work on those. But there are things that you can see. I mean, there are, there are visual differences. And if you, if you don't mind, I'd love to share some, That'd be some awesome. slides and give you some handy? ideas. I do have absolutely share your screen. That's I do have some awesome. pictures handy. Okay. Um, let's just begin right here. And this is a small brook in Glacier National Park. Um, because of the density of the trout, because there might be fly fishers present, I am not going to reveal <laughs> the location of this video, of this uh, picture, because I don't want to send lots of people tromping up there necessarily. Um, but this is a small brook. It is in the Lake McDonald watershed. This is early June. These are West Slope cutthroat. If you read um, one of the most important books about trout and salmon in North America, there, there have been a few areas where, where I think Benke's work has been superseded by more recent work and more genetic studies, but it really is a good foundation for understanding. Um, he knows that inland cutthroat trout, which is all of the different strains all up and down the Rockies, have no spots or only minute black spots in the top of the head. The West Slope cutthroat, even more particularly, which is one of the strains of, of inland cutthroat trout, have small irregular shaped spots, no or very few spots in the lower front of the body. And then you can begin to look, compare that to other strains of cutthroat trout or to rainbow trout, which have the tops of their heads heavily spotted. So if we just, if I just kind of jump through this a little bit, you see that fish move forward, you see our, uh, cutthroat trout move forward. The first thing, of course, is the, the feature that gives the cutthroat trout its name, um, that, that beautiful um, ruby necklace or that they, that they all have, that slash across the, the lower jaw. Um, they are closely, cutthroat are closely related to rainbow trout, but rainbow trout were not widely distributed around North America. It was really just a um, Pacific sort of a coastal fish until they began being stocked everywhere. So you see that slash there across the jaw where it gets its name. But then also, again, if you look in the background, you see very, very few spots below that lateral line in cutthroat in general or inland cutthroat general and particularly in West Slope cutthroat. And if you uh, look up at the head, Again, you see that the top front part of the body will have very few spots on it on the West Slope cutthroat. And Carl and Candy are asking, how, how big are these fish that we're looking at now through your underwater camera? Uh, so um, if I go back a little bit down the bottom, you might see a few four to five inch fish off to the right, just below my text. But the, the larger ones you're seeing there are about um, in the 11 to 14 inch range. So there were a couple in that pool that were over a foot long. There were no 18 inches or 20 inches in the pool, but the, the ones you're really seeing close to the screen were uh, 11 to 14 inches. And after spending quite a bit of time doing the photography, I did um, get a close up look at them with the use of my fly rod, which is how I have a really good idea how, how large they were. Excellent, excellent. In case you're wondering. Yes, that's awesome. Uh, I, I did do that. <laughs> good for you. Um, 
So, so there's some in that little stream in the Lake McDonald area. Now, um, it, it is certainly possible where I caught these that there has been some influence of rainbow trout genes uh, on these fish, but they really, really do look like they are, they still um, morphologically, or they still look like the, the West Slope cutthroat. You really don't see evidence, or I don't see any evidence in here of rainbow trout genetics, of invasive genetics infecting the fish. If we move on a little bit, here is another much smaller um, cutthroat trout. It's not spawning. It's not in its spawning colors. It's not as brightly colored. It's also a much smaller fish. This is about a five and a half inch fish. And this is Snyder Lake. It is mid-June. Um, also a West Slope cutthroat. You also see something that, that uh, Benke talks about, which is how irregular the shapes are. If you look at the spots, I mean, if you're really to zoom in, you'd, you'd really see they're, they're just blotches. They're not, you know, perfect circles uh, on the skin, but they're, they're irregular, they're blotched, they're small, but you still see, if you look in the jaw, that distinctive slash that makes it the cutthroat trout. In this one, it's less ruby red. It's more of a, almost an orange or a tangerine colored slash. So that's a Snyder Lake cutthroat. And so what are um, we, uh, what are we using here? For the fly? Yeah. <laughs> um, that is a little bit hard to tell uh, that Hmm. Is that going to be like a number 16? I mean, we're, we're pretty small. Yeah, here. that's looking like a, a little 16. I think the next photo, the one I used to, to, to bring that in for the photo, is, it might be a little clearer. Um, I would guess that that is a um, wolf, a royal wolf of some sort. Gotcha. Judging from the hackle. And probably one I tied. It's one of the few dry flies I tie. I tie a lot of wet flies and streamer flies. I am not very good at dry flies, but I do tie my own royal wolves. Um, there's a caddis. There, that's much more clearly a caddis. Very this good. is another small stream in the Lake McDonald watershed, closer to Lake McDonald. And you still see it's, it's clearly a cutthroat. It's clearly got that, again, slash on the throat. Really, really pretty. Again, this one's more of a tangerine than the, than the dark ruby red. Um, you got the par markings of a small fish. This was not cut out of Snyder Lake, but it was cut out of a very small stream on the south side of, of uh, Lake McDonald. Um, in fact, when I read about the fires later on the year after I left, this is one of the streams that I felt very sad about because this is one of the streams that came out of that fire, that 2007 fire area. Um, and here's another one from another nearby stream, beautiful slash on the throat, but a lot more spots on it. And because this is a stream that does flow without a huge gradient or without any major waterfalls down into um, Lake McDonald, which of course is one that has been impacted, uh, overrun by invasive species, I would guess that this fish has some rainbow trout genes in it. If you look at the yeah. number of spots, and in particular, if you look at the, the lower front part of the body and the spots on the head, suggesting that here's a place where the rainbow trout have gotten in, where they are beginning to genetically weaken the strain of the West Slope cutthroat. Yeah, interesting. Here is uh, the biggest cutthroat I caught on my trip. And it was actually taken out of the middle fork of the Flathead on the Glacier National Park boundary. Um, in the, uh, yeah, on the boundary of the park, on the middle fork. It was late June, around the 24th or 25th. Probably has some rainbow trout genes. And I say that based on two things, the, the spots in the top of the head and the fact that it's in the west, it's in the um, middle fork of the flathead, mm -hmm. which is of course, one of the rivers that's been dramatically overrun by invasive rainbow trout, but it still really is predominantly a cutthroat. If you look at the, um, 
the body, there are no spots or very few spots below that lateral line. Very pronounced slash, beautiful red slash on the throat. So here you have the cutthroat gene really holding out or predominating in this particular specimen of fish taken out of that river. Yeah, super interesting. Yeah, you see the, the slash is quite clear, the, the no spots below the lateral line. Um, yeah, that's a beautiful, that, that's a beautiful fish for sure. It was also a really fun one to catch. Yeah, I bet. Um, in that I saw it moving down the river and it clearly saw us. And I happened to be with the guide at the moment. And the guy said, oh, he sees us. There's no reason to cast for this. No reason to, to drop a fly in it. He's completely spooked. But I just put out a very beautiful uh, cast, dropped the dry fly on the surface about 20 feet in front of it. And then it was just as slow. It's the longest I've ever waited while this fish slowly moved up in the water column, slowly came to the top of the surface, looked over my fly. And the whole time I'm thinking he's going to turn away. He's going to turn away. He's going to turn away. And then sucked it in, sipped it in. Well, I know there what? are a lot of fishermen. I know there are a lot of fishermen who are all, we're all leaning really close to the camera, mm -hmm. <laughs> listening to that story. Um, yeah, it was yeah, about, um, it. you can't tell from the way I'm holding it because I, I, I really wanted to, you can see the water dripping off it. I, I really did not want to hold this out of the right. water for the picture. And that's why it's not a great picture of the fish because I, I sort of wet my hands and very quickly lifted it up for that photo, still wet and still dripping. Uh, before releasing it. Yeah. Uh, but you can still see it's uh, about a 17 and a half inch fish, which is good size for a cutthroat out of that river. Um, but again, as you said, you can see the, the, the real predominance of the West Slope cutthroat genes in it. On the other hand, if I go to this fish caught within a mile of that river, there is more evidence of uh, rainbow jeans. It's, it's certainly clearly got that cutthroat slash, um, more spots on it, uh, on the head, towards the front of the fish, lower down. Um, and then exact same spot, that fish. So all three of those fish were all caught out of the middle fork of the flathead, all within a mile of each other. And that bottom fish is just all rainbow trout. Uh, no so indication guides, of a guides, slash. The guides would probably call that middle fish a cut bow, right? That's correct. Although it, it, it you know, it, it leans more towards that cutthroat side. Right. Um, but yes, you know, that's sort of in that cut bow, that cut bow territory. Where the, whereas that bottom one is really all rainbow trout. And that's the problem, of course, is this, um, these invasive fish, which are altering, altering the ecosystem. And generally for the worst, they are less fed, less micro adapted. And the species around them are less adapted to their patterns and their spawning seasons. Well, and I don't want to get off on a tangent about, about lake trout and other animals. So oh, but yeah. we'll remind each other to get back to that. Yeah. Uh, Cause I think that's an important part of your book. How, you know, when we talk to a lot of people about the importance there, <coughs> there is a little bit of kind of the raising of hands, like what, well, so it's a fish. What, what's the big deal? And there is a big deal. And you talk about that in the book. Um, yeah. but, but let's keep going on your slides. Well, I'll give you one quick point to, for people to ponder. And then if we want to come back to it, there was a 95% collapse in the osprey population in Yellowstone Lake because of the introduction of lake trout. The introduction of lake trout into Yellowstone Lake caused a 95% collapse in the osprey population. And of course, you know, in Glacier National Park, they've been devastating to bull trout. But anyway, we can move on. Just a couple more yeah, pictures. Before you go from this, before oh. you go from that picture, Susan King was noting um, that there appears to be a change in the in the or change, a difference in the um, in the muzzle and the in the head shape between the two fish. Yes, the heads really, I mean, so so you can get down to things like counting the teeth you can sometimes tell the difference between different, sometimes with certain species or subspecies, the only way to tell the difference is to count the number of teeth or through genetic studies. Head shapes can vary differently, but they can vary differently within the same species based on how old they are, how mature they are, how much they've been eating. 
Um, so yes, this is more of a, uh, we think of it as a torpedo shape, um, that more of a rounded head. And that just may be the time of year or what, again, um, some age other factor, or, yeah. age, okay, yeah. Thank yeah it's, a bigger, it's a bigger fish. The rainbow is a longer fish than the cutthroat. Yeah. But that is a good observation. So there's one more cutthroat from um, Glacier National Park. This was uh, caught on the last day of June, actually, I don't know, in Hidden Lake. Uh, Hidden Lake was still about 90% covered with ice on the last day of June when I hiked in. Wow. Um, I foolishly did not want to carry, well, I didn't want to carry waders in because it's, you know, what, what is it, a three and a half mile hike in from the parking lot? Yeah, and it's um, pretty steep I, down, pretty steep back up. Yep. Didn't really want to carry waders seven miles in over, over snow. And so I thought I would w wet wade. I would just go out in my sandals and wade knee deep. And um, as you can tell, looking at the lake, it was about 33 degrees or 32 and a half degrees. I lasted about two minutes <laughs> before I was uh, back out trying to fish in the shore with my, with my uh, hiking boots on and wool socks. Um, but that's another cutthroat trout, but you'll notice it looks very different. For one, of course, it's, you have the bright red jaws. Um, and this is a spawning male. And it's um, really, the, it's an outlet spawner. So we typically think of trout as spawning in inlets. If they live in a lake, they'll swim up the stream that flows into the lake, but cutthroat trout in the Rockies often spawn in the outlets of lakes. They will go downstream to spawn. And so these fish were all stacked up right by the outlet of Hidden Lake, getting ready to spawn. Um, but I don't know, I, you could ask, you could ask, uh, your, your guests here, what they notice about the differences in this fish. Okay, chuck those into the chat, folks. What do you notice in the differences in this fish? So while we're getting some answers to that, um, that's really interesting about osprey. And lake trout, as I remember from your book, you know, there's a, there's a big difference in where they live. And so if you're a bear, there's a difference, right, about whether you're going to have access to a cutthroat trout or a lake trout. Exactly. They spawn, um, they spawn 40 to 50 or 60 feet deep in a lake or even deeper in places. So when a lake trout spawns, it is simply not available as nutrients to all the creatures that, that feed on fish that would feed on a cutthroat trout. Cutthroat trout spawn in this shallow water. And, and actually, it's great timing that you asked the question because about an hour or two before I caught that, I was standing at the outlet of the lake where you can see in my picture in the upper left corner, still wait, it was still in the period when I was, my legs were freezing and I was standing out <laughs> in knee deep icy water waiting and I heard splashing coming up the river behind me. And I didn't even have to turn to look to know what was coming. I just got out of the river as quickly as I could, got up on the shore and uh, a big good sized grizzly bear walked right up the stream. Um, right to where I had been standing a minute ago, fishing. Fortunately, when he got to this spot, he turned and went to the other shore rather than the shore I was on. But he was in there after these spawning cutthroat trout. Because when cutthroat trout spawn, they're spawning in shallow water and they are accessible nutrients. And in particular, when, when cutthroat trout spawn, which is in the spring, it's a really critical time for bear when there's not a lot of other food. Um, in a lot of places, there's spring spawn or shortly after ice out when bears are just coming, getting active, they may be just coming out of their, their dens for the summer. There are not a lot of berries available, whatever it is. And so you have this tremendously abundant uh, protein-rich food supply in cutthroat trout for creatures like bears, um, and, and as well as uh, lots of other mammals, otters and birds like osprey. Lake trout are just not available. They don't spawn in the shallows. They spawn in the deep shoals and the deep lakes. So yeah, to replace, cool. to put lake trout in a lake and have them decimate the cutthroat trout changes the whole ecosystem and takes away a food source from so many other animals, which is why the fight against lake trout in Glacier National Park is so important. Yeah. So Super were there any good comments here on the Oh yeah, no, you're, you have really good students tonight. All right. Professor Dickerson, um, and yeah. as all of you know, uh, Matthew is a professor 
um, at uh, Middlebury College, uh, one of the great colleges in America. Um, so Kathy says no spots on the face, fewer on the lower body, lots of spots yeah. on the tail. Yeah. Susan says lots of spots on the tail end of the body. S Susan Atkinson says pink line in the middle. Will says lots of red in the head area. And yes. Joanne says lots of bright color, bright color all the way to the tail. Excellent observation. So the observations of the bright color would have to do with that this is right at the peak of its spawn. And those males get brightly colored, um, presumably attractive or get the attention of the females in the spawning. But the spots are more key in identifying the species. This is one of a couple lakes in, in Glacier National Park that were actually stocked with a different species of cutthroat trout, a non-native species of cutthroat trout. They were stocked with Yellowstone cutthroat before people knew the difference, knew that there were different strains of cutthroat, that the different strains of cutthroat were micro adapted to particular places. And so um, what, you're, what we are likely, very likely seeing here is either a pure Yellowstone cutthroat trout or some sort of hybrid between a West Slope and a Yellowstone cutthroat trout. Although biologists tell me that this is one of the few places the two strains of cutthroat may very well um, cohabitate without a lot of um, cross breeding because of the different breeding seasons and different breeding um, uh, strategies and patterns. So you're probably looking at a non-native Yellowstone cutthroat trout here. Wow, that's- uh, Up in Hidden Lake. Super, super interesting. Yeah, there's for those folks who hike to Hidden Lake, if you go kind of a little past uh, where you normally would, right in this picture, actually, you can see the um, see the outlet there. Um, it's really worth taking your shoes off and waiting uh, if the bridge isn't yet in yet. And um, it, and it's a it's a great spot for sure. Yeah, right in where your cursor is. Yep, right in there is the is the outlet, and all these fish were stacked right up here, and they were feeding on little midges, little tiny little insects that were hatching off the silt in the bottom, and you could see the fish swimming along the bottom. And I'll get a little fly fishing nerdy for the fly fly anglers out there, um, but they would not hit anything on the surface, and they would not hit anything sinking because they were very specifically feeding on rising insects, and so in order to catch this fish, what I had to do is drop a fly out, let it sink to the bottom. All the cutthroat, as soon as my fly hit the surface, they all swam away, they were spooked. They weren't looking for something on the surface. I let it sink and then I let it sit there for about three minutes on the bottom. And then when the fish got unspooked and came back in, I lifted it off the bottom and they hammered it immediately. Um, because they were fishing on rising insects and they could tell anything that was falling, anything I dropped on the surface that was falling did not look natural to them. But there's your um, cutthroat trout, but not uh, a native species. And just because of the, the title of the book, I'll just show you one more. We're going to leave Glacier National Park just for a brief moment. I hope that's okay. Here is my um, Snake River fine spotted cutthroat trout from Corral Creek. And you can still see it holds the, you know, it has that same slash on the throat. It is clearly a cutthroat trout, clearly in that same species as the West Slope cutthroat, but in a different disconnected uh, watershed. This has probably been isolated from the West Slope cutthroat for 10,000 years or more since they crossed different watersheds. And, um, and this is the one that's micro adapted to the upper stretches of the Snake River. Wow. And so that's the, that's the first one of that subspecies I ever caught that I pulled out of uh, Corral Creek and Wyoming. And again, would not have, if I hadn't written this book, I don't think I would ever have begun to pay the close attention to even within the species of a fish known as cutthroat trout, the differences in, in the spotting, the size of the spots, how big they are, how they're distributed around the body, um, the difference between, again, the fish here in the top, that fine spotted cutthroat, and then the fish in the bottom of the picture in the background, which is your West Slope um, cutthroat with denser spots, um, bit larger spots, especially on the tail. Yeah. 
Oh, it's beautiful fish. Thank you for, for sharing those slides with us and giving us a little bit of a kind of a lesson on that. Um, to, you know, uh, you, you did this as an artist in residence at Glacier. You've been an artist in residence in a couple of other parks. We talked a little bit about Acadia. Um, yes. I want to encourage folks to, to, this is your book club, not mine. So uh, feel free to log in with a bunch of questions. Um, and, and Jill's going to kind of help uh, curate the, those questions for us here uh, in a minute. I want to talk though briefly as we do that transition, um, you, you're going to come out with this fourth book. Tell us a little bit about the fourth book, where that's going to take place, how that's going to take place. Um, that sounds pretty exciting. Yeah, I guess the, the final book in the series um, is set in Alaska and primarily in Bristol Bay. I think what originally brought me up to the Bristol Bay area was the, the threat of the Pebble Mine project, putting the largest open pit heavy metal mine in the world at the head of the world's most important wild salmon water, where 50% of the world's sockeye salmon and 30% of the world's wild salmon harvest um, come from. So I wanted to, to visit the area and, and spend time there firsthand and write about um, the ecosystem there, the way that salmon play a role in those rivers, very similar to what cutthroat trout do in, um, in Glacier National Park. They tie the whole ecosystem together. They connect, they connect the big water with the little tiny headwater streams. They connect the forests with the rivers. Everything is interdependent. What happens in the forest and the soil affects the river and what happens in the river affects the, the lakes and the oceans and vice versa. You can't impact one thing. We can't change one thing without it impacting everything else. We talk about every, we all live downstream of one another. And I guess the irony with fish is even if you're upstream, you're downstream. If that, if right. that makes any, right. you no, know, that if that makes, that makes that any makes sense. sense. Um, well, that I think great. That, so four books in the series, Trout yeah. in the Desert, um, the Trail of Three Rivers. Tail of Three Rivers. Of That's three set rivers. in the Appalachians, and it's about brook yeah. trout. Fine, fine spotted trout, and then uh, upcoming your uh, as yet titled book on Alaska. I think the title of the book is going to be "At the End of a Line: The Past and Future of Alaska's Char," and it will be primarily about Dolly Varden Char and Arctic Char um, in Alaska. Yeah, That's, with a focus on on the. Bristol Bay area. So many books, go. so little time. <laughs> so well, uh, Jill, we can transition to some questions and I know you you had a question yourself, so we can perhaps start there. I wanna remind everybody next, uh, the next book is Land on Fire. We will be giving a copy of that away. Um, and if you uh, would like your uh, book plate signed by Matthew uh, for your copy of this book, please simply email grace at, at uh, glacier.org. Uh, and she will take care of that matter for you in uh, short order. Um, and thank you, Matthew, for that. Um, so Jill, you were asking about that. Jill is, Jill is quite a shutterbug herself. Um, <laughs> so you, you had a question about the camera. I did. I'm, I'm a big camera nerd and I love gear. So I was wondering, um, I have a two-part question, actually. Um, mm -hmm. What kind of, did you have like different camera gear? Did you have one camera? Yes. Did you use like a different camera to take those underwater videos? Yeah, so I, I did. And you, you may be disappointed with the, with the answer. You know, I had my DSLR <laughs> for all my wildlife photos and all my scenery photos. And I had some um, significant uh, filming mm -hmm. um, video, video cameras uh, with me as well, because I was working on some videos of Glacier National Park. Mm -hmm. But the embarrassing thing is that the underwater photos were just a GoPro. Okay, cool. I was wondering that. Yeah. I, I use that too for water photography and it, it, they work great. They, so. <laughs> they do work really well. Um, yeah. Cool. So they capture we populate, the scene. And, as yeah. we populate some other questions, um, also as so I'll go from camera geek to kind of fishing geek, you talk about your LL Bean backpacking rod. Yes. Um, but but what's your go to gear? You know, I don't want to get into the very politically contentious fishing debate of row versus weight. Yeah. Um, I'm very much a weight guy versus a rowing guy, but um, we'll leave that for the politicians. Um, so talk to us about kind of 
What's your go-to? What's your go-to gear when you're not in the yellow bean backpacking gear? I really love to just stand in the water. I like the connection of feeling the current go past me. I have been in rivers before fishing when um, just my standing in the bottom has has uh, caused just enough sediment to move around and a few insects have kicked free. And I've watched trout swim right up and just hold behind my, my foot. And I'm talking like 18 inch trout have just come right up while I've been fishing and just sat in the river <laughs> behind my foot, feeding off the little insects that, that kick, kicked up every time I shift my weight a little bit. And it turns out it's really, really hard to drift a fly to a fish that's behind your foot without catching yourself. Um, so I really do love to, to be in the river. Um, I like fly fishing. And, um, you know, I think give me a nine foot five weight. If they're rising, I'm happy to fish with dry flies. Uh, but I, I know that there's, there's, you know, dry fly fishermen who, who don't like fishing with anything else, but the reality is probably less than 5% of a trout's diet is above the surface or on the surface. And 95% of what a trout eats is below the surface. So I actually feel like it's more natural to fish below the surface with nymphs or whatever they are uh, that they're eating. Uh, Here in Colorado, uh, we call, and New Mexico, we call what you were describing as the San Juan, Juan shuffle. shuffle. Yeah. My, my question to you, Matthew, is in Colorado, we have about five different species of cutthroat trout. In the, in the whole West, are there 20, 30 species? Anyway, were, no, for, what, how many there are? There were probably about 16 or so uh, strains or subspecies of cutthroat trout 150 years ago. Um, I think four to five of them are now extinct or believed to be extirpated, extinct, um, including the largest species. Um, the largest trout species in North America was probably a, a cutthroat trout that would that grew up to 65 pounds um, pretty regularly in, wow. in uh, the Lahontan cutthroat, and they're gone. Um, the story on cutthroat trout in Colorado has changed a little bit in the past, fifth, past 10 years in terms of what scientists think. Genetic studies have actually revealed a lot more information. They used to think there were three native species, I think, in Colorado. Um, and they've discovered that stocking began in Colorado a lot earlier than anyone thought. There were um, cutthroat trout being moved around and stocked in Colorado at least as early as 1880 and possibly earlier. Um, but that's a, a rough answer to your, to your question. There's, and, and even, um, even the, the migratory revolutionary history of cutthroat, uh, there's, there's some new, new theories. I think for a long time it was held that they primarily colonized up the Columbia River Basin, up the Columbia, up the Snake River, and then managed at the end of the last ice age to get across some watersheds and some of those little ponds like beaver ponds that sit at the top of a divide and have streams flowing out both sides. Or in one case, there actually was likely an earthquake, which shifted is actually shifted an entire stream to a different watershed. Um, but now there's some evidence that that uh, cutthroat might have colonized up the Colorado River. Um, 10,000 years or more. So there's a there's a couple different theories and um, new evidence that comes up. Uh, on that. But the, I think the quick answer to the question is I think around 15 or 16 different identifiable subspecies or strains of cutthroat, of which there's about a dozen or so um, still, still all alive. And there's some disagreement, like some people do not count the fine spotted, the snake river fine spotted as a separate subspecies of cutthroat trout, because genetically they've been indistinguishable from a Yellowstone cutthroat. But if you look at them, they're clearly distinguishable. You can, and if you breed two snake river fine spotted cutthroat and you breed two Yellowstone cutthroat, they produce two different fish that are visibly different. You just can't tell the difference in genetics. So that's a rough answer. Scientists will disagree about 
15, 16 versus 17. Thank you. Yeah. Carl, I see you have your hand raised. Do you want to ask a question? Oh, yes, I do. Uh, Matthew, on page yeah. 67, oh, uh, no. you would re- <laughs> Hi. Uh, you a very reference- specific question. I love this. You actually read the book. <laughs> oh, you better believe it. Uh, you made a reference to the monarch butterfly. Uh, we yes. had lived near Pismo Beach in the San Luis Obispo area, so we knew a lot more about butterflies than fish. But anyway, I thought that was uh, a really neat comparison about the butterflies to the fish. And you also made a comment that fish also need different types of water at different times in the year. Yes. So I'm really interested in that. What, what are the different types of water? Is it different temperatures, different minerals or nutrients or what's needed? So in the winter time, um, the fish are gonna need a different, a deep, deeper water, deeper habitat that doesn't, that doesn't freeze solid. Um, on a hot summer, they might also need, depending on where they are, I mean, it's gonna depend on where you are, but they may, there's times of the year when they're gonna need deeper, deeper, slower moving water. When they are spawning, mm. they need that shallow, highly oxygenated water. Not necessarily because the spawning fish need that oxygen, but because the eggs need that very high uh, level of, of oxygen. So those would just be two examples. Um, the water that's not going to freeze in the winter, those deeper pools, the shallower mm. riffles during spawning, during spawning season. Um, if, if I remember right, bull trout can spawn up to 90 miles all the way up the North Fork of the Flathead River, all the way up to, to Canada to find the spawning water that's just perfect for them. But as a really big predatory fish, they have to move downstream to deeper water for, for most of the year to find the food and the habitat they need. Very good. Thank you. Um, when you were answering the earlier question, Matthew, um, Matthew in our group was wondering when you were talking about the different species of trout and you had mentioned a few that had gone extinct. Do you know how those types of trout became extinct? In a couple cases, um, they were living in large lakes, I think, in the, in, um, and their tributary rivers were dammed. So they simply couldn't get to their spawning habitat. Mm-hmm. So damming of rivers, fragmentation of watersheds has certainly been one cause of that. Invasive species is another. Um, in, in Glacier National Park, um, um, and I think I, I mentioned this in my book, right? There were 12 lakes in the West Slope that had native bull trout. And the invasive lake trout that eventually moved up from Flathead Lake have extirpated the bull trout from nine of those. Uh, and you know, they've really, it, the work in Upper Quartz Lake has really been uh, phenomenal, important, protecting the lake trout, but it was too late in other, in other places. Mm-hmm. Um, so invasive species and, and dams, fragmentation of rivers would be two, two big causes. Often it's multiple stressors. It's often not just um, invasive species or, but decline of water quality, decline of spawning habitat, fragmentation from the building of dams. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Um, dams have certainly been a, a major problem in New England with Atlantic salmon and uh, all up and down the Pacific Northwest, uh, particularly in, uh, for example, the Snake River. Uh, yeah, one of our other books for last year, which you're probably familiar with, um, Engineering Eden, uh, yeah. its whole th- theory is uh, particularly about national parks, how from trapping wolves to introducing you know, fish, I mean, they introduced fish in Glacier Park, right? We've introduced fish as the National Park Service, not recently, but, um, you know, sure. we, we, we've said about engineering Eden, and even as we think about the work we're doing to try and restore it, we're also engineering Eden, right? Um, that we're going in and taking out lake trout and putting back in a species, and in so doing, we are fiddling with the current stasis, if you mm-hmm. will, um, in nature. So it's a, it's a complicated Thing, especially when with all this connectivity in keystone species. 
Uh, One of the things I really appreciated about the Park Service and USGS biologists working in um, in Glacier National Park was the tremendous humility that they showed any time they tried to make any sort of any any sort of decision like that. It was never taken lightly or just all right. Here's a problem. Let's let's do this dramatic thing and fix it. You now it was really carefully thought out. What are the what are the risks? What are the um, what are the the benefits? What are the, what is the need that would cause us to do that? Yeah. Yeah. By the way, I think uh, Carl, who mentioned the butterflies, I don't know if you've ever read this book, but a really wonderful book I read a few years ago is Four Wings and a Prayer by Sue Halpern. Book I would highly highly recommend. And um, in case you didn't pick it up from my book, but if you really want to read more about trout and cutthroat trout in the Rockies, I'd also recommend um, Kurt Fausch's book um, for the Love of Rivers. Uh, is a really wonderful, wonderful source, beautifully written by a, a really important um, scientist. One other book I read when I was artist in, artist in residence, it's a really fascinating um, uh, book, again, written by a scientist, but I think for a, a general audience is The Hidden Life of Trees by Peter Wollobin. It's another really, really fascinating book. That's what prompted probably the most important prompting of my current work of fiction, which is a work of echo, echo fantasy, I'm calling it, um, inspired by Wollobin's book, The Hidden Life of Trees. Cool. That's awesome. Yeah. And if anyone wants to see some videos, by the way, of some, of of some cutthroat, uh, I'd be, I would, could share that with you. Oh, yeah. Do we have time or do we have a a, a lot of While while you're, while you're setting that up, um, uh, uh, Andre Annenberg, uh, congratulations. You are the winner of our, uh, book, uh, Land on Fire, another incredibly important book. Um, I'm really excited to have Gary Ferguson come and talk to us. It's been a, obviously a huge issue in Glacier. Um, and in, this is a very current book talking about um, wildfire fighting, wildfire causes, climate change, uh, really interesting book. So we'll pop that in the mail to you uh, uh, here in the next couple of days. I think you'll very much enjoy it. Um, uh, and and uh, this year I'm going to be and and it's very surprising actually that Matthew joined us. Um, uh, I am going to pen a book review of each of our reviews for the Big Fork Eagle this year, and um, and Matthew agreed to join even after I published that book review. Although I, I did title it Hook Line and Sinker, so um, obviously I'm a big fan. Um, so so that'll be fun to uh, to be able to to do that going forward. So with that, I'll hand the screen over to you, Matthew, and let's look at some videos. There's a couple. This is that same pool and um, same GoPro. Oh, wait, yeah, you don't see it yet. Sorry. I'm I'm looking at it. You're not. (laughs) Here we go. Um, Do you see it now? We see your uh, home page. Oh, sorry. Hit the (laughs) wrong button there. You think after three years of. (laughs) Was that Acadia? No, let's, oh, I just got to go in full screen mode, sorry. There we go. There we go. And now you should see it. Mm-hmm. Yep. And these are, this is not a, a, a fishery. This, I mean, this is not a hatchery. This is a wild stream. You can see the bright red of those spawning males. Uh, if I back up right, right there. I mean, there is just wow. classic spawning male cutthroat trout. And just so dense in here mm-hmm. at the outlet of this lake. But what I wanted to show you is um, a couple of connections. Yes, she's watching. She's on there. Wow. So it was the connections I made between um, three very, very different geographic places, and yet how fish are the central, spawning fish are central to them. These are alewives that are being restored to streams all up and down the coast of Maine that were extirpated from almost every single river in in Maine, except for like two major alewife runs, primarily from dams. 
dams and road buildings um, all up and down the coast of Maine. And this is a stream in which they had just uh, a few years ago created a new natural passage under what had been a culvert, which had blocked the alewives from spawning. So this is a recently restored run of alewives, and now they're coming up in the tens of thousands and absolutely critical to the to the recovery of the whole Gulf of Maine. Wow. So many creatures depend on these and sort of the, the same lessons I'm, I'm learning in Glacier National Park a year later, I was learning in um, in the Gulf of Maine. And uh, actually, let me show you just one more because I think it's also. That's interesting. I was really interested too in the culvert work. I've always rude them because I, they break, the fish will go into them and break my lines, but now I have even more reason <laughs> to hate them. <laughs> just gonna set up this last one here. Uh, two more actually that I wanted to show you that I thought you might appreciate. Uh, particularly if you're those of you who in a year or so grab my last book in the series. And this should get it to you. I think you can see that now. Oh my. Oh my gosh, look at that. And these are sockeye salmon. They have come at this point only 90 miles and 1200 feet in elevation gain in Katmai National Park, where a lot of my new book is gonna be set. <laughs> and I would argue that the cutthroat trout in Glacier National Park are as important to that ecosystem as these cutthroat are. It's also part of the reason why I thought the, the Pebble Dam was such a horrible, <laughs> horrible idea. But you can see uh, one big difference is these fish are in the process of dying even before they begin to spawn, unlike cutthroat trout. So it's a little bit uh, creepy to look down and see all the, you know, the half dead fish right. uh, still swimming around, which you can see. You can but see one why last... they have all the food for the fat bear contest at Catmart. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and uh, that river actually is in the same watershed. That is about, uh, oh. no, sorry, that's a different, that's a different river that where, that, where I got that one. It's not the same, the same watershed. Um, and so we're still this? in Bristol Bay. And this, oh, you should recognize this one. This is back to Glacier National Park. Okay. But it's a very different little picture of some, of some little cutthroat trout. So this has got to be Snyder. Yes, it is. Excellent. You got to watch this year. one carefully. Oops, I just accidentally hit pause. Oh. <laughs> My video is um, freezing. Let's try this again. There we go. See that little fish there? The bottom, just to the left of the log, the left of the rock okay. in the bottom of the screen. Oh, yeah, tiny. Yep, mm -hmm. these are six or seven inch there he fish. Is. Little cutthroat trout. Now there's a pair of them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this was June, late June? That was late June. And as yeah. I talked to the biologists and um, they're recognizing more and more how hard it is to protect some of the lower rivers, some of the biologists who really think that some of the future of the West Slope cutthroat trout really are up in some of these tiny little streams and up in these high lakes that are above the impassable barriers. Um, and how important therefore it becomes to, pr to protect those rivers and those streams um, as well. Because that is cold, clean water, right? So Snyder that is, is cold, the, clean water. Snyder is the ice skater's friend. A lot of people, like, a lot of friends who go up and ice skate Snyder because um, it freezes really hard and really fast and flat. Um, What's the... Yeah, what's the name of the bridge crossing? It had a, a really interesting name when you follow the trail up. Um, you go past where Snyder Lake turns off to the left. And then if you're right. heading into Trout Lake, you go down over a bridge, just across the bridge, you turn right as if you were going to head over to um, 
on that trail. Yeah, I don't the bridge remember. right over Snyder Snyder Creek. Someone in this group ought to ought to know what that is. Yes, and, yes. And uh, I was laying on my belly on that bridge with my GoPro, very tenuously tied to a long branch, sticking it in the water, and hoping that that branch didn't break with a four hundred dollar piece of equipment <laughs> floating off the stream. But it worked. That is bold. And, um, <laughs> and I and I and I got the got the fish. I stared over that bridge for an hour before I finally saw them, and wow. um, and was able to get it positioned in the right place uh, to catch them. <laughs> so we've got we've, we've just got a few minutes left, but Jill, go ahead. I was going to ask: Is that helpful? Like having all those photos and videos to review? Like, does that kind of help your writing or influence it in any way when you go it, back to write your works? It certainly does. I mean, there's so much to write about. And um, I wanted to spend a lot of time the in, in place, in Glacier, just quiet, listening and writing. Um, so a typical day for me when I was artist in residence is I would get up maybe a half hour before, um, an hour before sunrise or half hour before first light, grab a coffee, grab um, my camera and my hiking chair and I would hike maybe when I was alone, I didn't want to go really back country for reasons of safety, not just bears, but tripping and falling. So I, I tried to stay within, um, you know, a certain, a certain distance of the road for safety, safety reasons, but I would hike in some place. Um, it might, it might have just been uh, the riverside by Avalanche Creek, um, or that was, um, that was a little like John's Lake uh, was, was what place I would go. And I would just hike into John's Lake, break, put my chair out and I would try to just sit still for an hour and not do any writing and just listen, mm -hmm. watch, make mental notes, pay attention to the bark of trees, the way the wind could move through the branches, what birds were singing, what, what wildlife was doing. Um, and then after an hour of just sitting and watching and listening, then I would pull out um, my notepad or my iPad, and I would just take notes. I wouldn't try to write polished prose, but I would just write down what I saw, what I was thinking about, complete sentences, but not trying to polish it. And I might do that for a couple hours. And then I would go back to my, to my room, my artist cabin, and try to turn those notes into more polished prose, into an essay that I could share with somebody. And that would be when I would think, Oh, what, you know, what was that tree that I saw there? And I remember it and I wrote something about it, but, but the process of writing would make me think of something else I hadn't taken notes of. And then I would, and that's when having my camera and pulling out the pictures yeah. would, would really be helpful. Or the embarrassing story is that um, I did not know uh, what the Harlequin duck was. So here <laughs> I am in early June, uh, I was so foolish, you know, to not, you know, not know what a harlequin duck was. And my very first morning there, I'm just sitting by the stream and a harlequin duck, a male harlequin, comes swimming right past me. And I pull out my camera and I take a bunch of photos of it. And it was a really beautiful bird, but I didn't know it was this really special thing. And then for the rest of the week, every person I'm meeting is out there with their big camera saying, yeah, we've, we've been here all week trying to see a harlequin duck. <laughs> <laughs> and I would pull out and I said, is this one? <laughs> um, and so sometimes the, the camera would be helpful for that, just identifying, like, I don't know what the species is. Let's take a picture and identify it later. But it would be a prompt for my writing. It would be helpful for identifying things as well. Yeah. That's cool. Well, we are so privileged to have your support um, and friendship. Um, once again, thanks, thanks, thanks for spending an incredible evening um, with us. And uh, a large group of, of glacier lovers from uh, literally from coast to coast. Uh, we have people on the phone who can see the Atlantic Ocean, people who can see the Pacific Ocean. Jim Fish can see a long way from Sacramento, so that's why I'm giving you the, uh, the Pacific Ocean there, Jimmy. Um, <laughs> and um, Matthew Dickerson, um, your generosity um, and kindness in you know, putting us in your book, uh, al allowing us to be the beneficiaries of your work, uh, and in more than ways than just financially, that you clearly care about this place and its future, um, which is our entire mission. 
Um, so thank you for uh, another fabulous evening. Thanks to everybody for uh, joining in the fun. Uh, we're off to a great start in 2022. Um, we're going to do these a uh, little more spaced apart. I got some feedback last year that kind of by the time you finished the next one, you had to really rush into the second one and wanted to be a little more deliberative. Um, and uh, so we'll be back at this again in March. Um, and Matthew, thanks again for being with yeah. us. And I will say one thing. Um, at the beginning, you said I sort of asked my publisher to to match my my um, donation of my my uh, royalties to the book. But I, I should give full credit. To, I didn't even mention that. The publisher kind of jumped out on his own. When I said I wanted to do it, he jumped out and said, I'll match it. Awesome. And he was he was very generous in doing that. So yeah. I can't take credit for his generosity well, there. That's that's kind of you and and uh, kind of your publisher. Please extend our thanks. And I will. It's, it's what Glacier does to people, right? It makes us. It does. Uh, it, it does something to our hearts and makes us want to be a part of it. So, um, so thanks again. Thanks everybody for your time. I know it's valuable, and I want to uh, yeah, wish you all a great evening uh, and a 2022 that I hope is filled for you and yours with healing and renewal. Um, for you, our communities, and our entire world. So thanks again and good night.